Welcome to part eight of the English settlement of the New World. Now we're going to talk about the later colonies. Now, as mentioned before, once Charles II became king of England, one of the things he did is he began rewarding some of those people that helped him uh, regain uh, the throne. And the way he would do this is by giving them lands in the New World. One of the first groups that he's going to give land to is in 1663, he's going to give a group of eight of his friends uh, control of all the land in North America between the 30th and 36th parallel. They're going to name it Carolina. Well, you can say that anyways. They'll name it Carolina, which is, of course, the Latin word for Charles, and it's named after King Charles II. But it actually already had that name. It had been called that by the French in honor of King Charles IX. So no matter how you look at this, Carolina is named after one of these King Charleses. Okay. They are going to set up a eight-man proprietorship, a Palatine Court is what they're going to call it. Now, a Palatine Court is a supreme legislature and a supreme court all wrapped up in one fixture with these eight men running it, right? It is going to be assisted by a grand council, right, which is going to be, uh, which is going to compose legislation for the Palatine Court to approve or disapprove, and it's going to be helped by a popularly elected general assembly who had the power to veto actions of the grand council. Uh, Grand Council. So you see there's a little bit of a checks and balance system set up here. Uh, not grand, though, because in the ultimate grand scheme of things, this is still just a limited oligarchy, right? It's not really a republic. These eight men are ultimately in charge, right? Now, Carolina itself remained this large individual colony, but it also developed two personalities. In the southern half of the colony, you started to have with the establishment of Charlestown, you uh, had uh, a uh, massive trade network that developed, a commercial trade empire grows, largely based on actually uh, the slave trade between uh, Africa and the uh, Caribbean, okay? But uh, in the north, it's gonna be mostly tobacco farming. So you literally have kind of a Hatfield and McCoy kind of relationship developed between the north and the south. The north and southern halves of Carolina are constantly feuding with each other, so much so, in fact, that finally in 1712, Queen Anne is going to split the colony up. She's going to create a North Carolina and a South Carolina to separate these two parties. Our next colonies are New York and New Jersey, but we've got to get a little background on this one first before we proceed, uh, because this land that we're talking about, especially this area uh, that we now call New York, is, is actually owned by the Dutch, right? They'd established a colony there. They've called their colony New Netherlands and their capital city, New Amsterdam, right? And they're in a great spot. They're right in between the Massachusetts uh, Bay Colony and the Virginia and Maryland colonies to the south. And at this time, there's a lot of raw materials being pulled out of the colonies and sent to England, right? The English are using this to spark their industrial revolution. And ultimately, England will be the first to have an industrial revolution. It's largely because of this, okay? So the Dutch are more than happy to be involved with the shipping of these goods and placed strategically in between these two uh, large colonies, it's perfect. But the English have a problem with this. So what are they going to do? They are going to pass a series of navigation acts. Two of them are actually going to be passed under the rump parliament, which was the parliament that was in charge back when the king, there was no king, right? You're going to have two navigations passed in 1651 and then early 1660. And then you're going to have a third one passed by King Charles II in 1663, right? The third one required that all English goods coming from America had to be shipped on English ships and had to pass through English ports before they went to wherever their destination was. So even if their destination was not England, it had to go through an English port first. Okay? This effectively cut the Dutch completely out of the shipping business as far as English raw goods from the Americas. Okay? But then the following year, Charles II takes it one step further. He gives all that land between New England and the uh, uh, Virginia and Maryland colonies to the Duke of York. So he's just giving away land that he doesn't own, right? The Duke of York says, well, okay, well, I got to take possession of this land. I got to take it from the Dutch. Um, can I borrow your navy? 
And of course, Charles II says, sure, I mean, because why not? The Duke of York, after all, is his brother, James. James will eventually become King James II of England. Okay, so the Royal Navy, under the command of Richard Nichols, in August of 1664, will confront the Dutch governor, Peter Stuyvesant, uh, in New Amsterdam. Okay, and pretty much tell him, you need to get out of here. You're, uh, this is now English territory. This is actually going to trigger a war between England and the Dutch in 1667, the Second Anglo-Dutch War, right? But ultimately, England is going to take possession of this land. The Duke of York now has this land, and he decides, I don't like the names. So he's going to change them, right? New Netherlands? No, I don't like that. I'm going to name it after myself. He names it New York. New Amsterdam? Doesn't like that either. He's going to name that after himself, too. New York City, okay? The southern half of the territory he was given, though, he's going to break off and give to a couple friends of his own, right? He's going to give New Jersey to the south. He's going to give it to his friends Lord Barclay and Sir George Cartier, right? Now, initially, these two men are going to run this uh, colony of New Jersey, but in, in 1675, Lord Barclay is going to decide that he wants to sell his holdings, which is the western half of New Jersey. So, New Jersey gets broken into West Jersey and East Jersey, and West Jersey is sold to a claimant named John Fenwick, who is representing a group of Quakers. Okay, That is going to actually cause some problems, because, as we'll talk about in a minute, there is already a Quaker colony established called Pennsylvania. Right? It was uh, uh, controlled by a man named William Penn, and ultimately is this dispute about whether or not Quakers should be allowed to own West Jersey as well as it continued to intensify. For a time, West Jersey was placed under the control of William Penn, but ultimately, finally in 1702, King William will go ahead and reunify New Jersey and make it its own singular colony. Next, we have New Hampshire, which I probably could have talked about before the uh, English Civil War, but the reason why I saved it for here is that it will not be given autonomy until Charles II grants it to them in 1679, right? But its settlement dates far before that. In 1623, Captain John Mason is given a grant for the land uh, that is now uh, New Hampshire, and he sends David Thompson and Edward and Thomas Hilton to establish a a uh, fishing con uh, uh, colony there on the Pizzicatawa uh, River, okay? So that's its initial origins, but it's always just going to be kind of a small settlement. That is until one of the religious dissenters uh, uh, um, end up um, uh, immigrating into the region. It all begins with a woman named Anne Hutchinson. Anne Hutchinson is a citizen of Boston. She arrived there in 1634, right? Uh, she was inspired by the ministry of John Cotton, and so much so, in fact, that she began holding meetings after church to discuss the sermons of the day. That developed into, from discussions to critiques, and she started to develop quite the following. Her going over the ministries of the day, the, minister, the, the ministers of the days, and what they're saying, and what was right about it, and what was wrong with it. And this is a huge no-no in Puritan society. Right, because for one, you're you're questioning the elect leadership of the uh, congregation and therefore the colony. And number two, again, she's a woman; she's not supposed to be doing this kind of thing. Right, that fell outside the doctrines of what was appropriate in Puritan society. Right, and so in 1637, she was tried for heresy. Right, she was convicted and banished. Now. Ultimately, her followers will end up in New Hampshire. She will move initially to Rhode Island, to the breakaway colony under Roger Williams, and then she'll move the, to the Dutch colony of New Netherlands, where her and most of her family will be killed in, uh, in a uh, attack by Native Americans, right? But several of her fo followers, led by a guy named John Wheelwright, will immigrate into New Hampshire. And so that's going to form the core of the population that actually settles New Hampshire in any sizable numbers. And that's what leads to eventually 1679. Charles II, after being petitioned by these groups, will grant New Hampshire a separate charter, separating its authority from Massachusetts, which had been exerting authority over New Hampshire prior to that.
Next we have the colony of Pennsylvania, which was settled by Quakers. Now Quakers are a relatively new group in uh, English society. They were formed by a guy named George Fox. They, they call themselves the Society of Friends, but their name comes from the fact that George Fox said that his flock should tremble at the name of the Lord. You know, you hear God's name, you should tremble and you're quaking, right? That, so again, it's not a compliment, but that's what people started calling them, right? So in 1667, William Penn became a Quaker. Now, William Penn's father was a member of the British aristocracy and an admiral in the Royal Navy. And he had been an ardent supporter to get King Charles back on the throne after uh, the uh, English Civil War. So he was owed a debt. However, Admiral William Penn, same name, Admiral William Penn died before that debt could be collected. But William Penn, the son, is going to decide to try and cash in that uh, debt, right? He's going to petition the king to give him some kind of land for Quakers in the New World as repayment to the debt owed to his father. King Charles II decides, yes, we will give you this land, uh, but under one condition, you have to name it after your father, right? So, Pennsylvania is named after William Penn, not William Penn, okay? Now, the colony is an absolute proprietorship. William Penn, the son, obviously, uh, is the sole uh, owner of the land. He is in control of it, um, and he's going to go there to try and create his own city upon a hill, a Quaker city upon a hill, Philadelphia, right? Um, but as the colony grew, it's only going to be about 10% settled by Quakers, right? He starts to run into problems. A lot of people don't like the fact that he is the sole proprietor, that he runs this place like a dictatorship. So much so, in fact, that he's actually going to create an advisory council in order to try and settle some of the unrest and say, look, you know, I got other people giving me advice. I have other advisements uh, um, on uh, the running of this government. That is going to expand in 1701 to the Charter of Privileges, right? It's going to quell the resentment over that absolute power of the sole proprietorship and give a lot more power to the advisory council. Along with that, it'll also detach in 1703 the three lower counties, and those three lower counties will become Delaware. So the last of these original colonies is going to be Georgia, and it's going to be created a lot later. In 1732, General James Oglethorpe will be sent to establish Georgia as a military buffer zone between Spanish Florida and the commercial center of Charleston and South Carolina, right? Now, Oglethorpe had, prior to uh, taking on this new charter, had been an administrator of prisons there back in England. And when you take a look at what he develops here in Georgia, it definitely has a very prison-like flavor. First of all, he decides it'd be a good place to use as a refuge for debtors and the poor. Because he knew as an administrator of prisons back there in England that the majority of the people in jail in England were in jail for not paying their debts. So he says, we can use this. And that's how I can populate it. I can use these pe people that are in, in, in jail for debts. However, don't think that just because you're in debt, you can get to Georgia. You had to pass an interview process. This is a very draconian style government he sets up. You have to interview. You have to be amongst the deserving poor, right? Are you poor because you just had a run of bad luck are you, or are you poor because you're just a screw up? Well, if you're the latter, you're not gonna get to go. If you're the pre prior, then yes. On top of that, there's a lot of other rules too. The uh, the Government of Georgia is just run by a small group of people that are called the trustees. A very prison feel to it. The sale of alcohol is absolutely banned. All settlements must be closely clustered together for easy defense. Remember, this is a military zone. Um, the use of slaves and slavery, banned. No slavery. That doesn't come into Georgia until, much, uh, until a little bit later, right? Uh, Catholicism, don't apply. You got to be Anglican, right? No religious tolerate a toleration. Matter of fact, there's no legislature in Georgia either, right? It's all just run by these trustees. 
So that establishes the last of these colonies. And the one thing you should really take out of this when you take a look at all these colonies is you've got to realize they're all started at different times, 125 years separated, and for very different reasons. And that's going to be something that's important as we move forward.